Hello again, Mr. Feige. It's me, Nando, the YouTuber who secretly writes all the Marvel movies and some of the shows. Well, I write the first five episodes and then I hand it off to you guys for the finale. I haven't seen any of them yet. How'd they go? Anyway, I want to send you a video with my next big idea. Like it said in that letter you sent over. Please, Nando, we're out of movie ideas, and we're going to have to shut down Marvel unless you give us another certified banger. Where would we be without your ideas like Make Sharon Carter Bad or Third Ant-Man Movie? We'd be bankrupt, I tells ya. I don't know why I'm reading the letter you wrote me. Whatever. Anyway, I saw your ideas for Spider-Man. I had a few suggestions. Like, uh, it says here, Tony Stark Weekend at Bernie's. It sounds a little grim. Also this idea, do a fashion show where Peter tries on 50 costumes for action figures. Feels a little transparent. I liked it better in No Way Home, where he was just constantly wearing different suits for no good reason. That was very clever. But I think the main issue here is that there's no story. It's just a fashion show and Tony Stark's corpse. So I have an idea. A pitch for a new Spider-Man movie that follows No Way Home. And I wanted to share it with you. Remember, don't share this with people. Otherwise, they'll all see it and you'll have to pretend we don't work together and make a completely different movie. This is just between us. And I'll try not to upload this to my YouTube channel, although I can't promise anything. Okay, so before the pitch, I wanted to look at the most important part of this story, the villain. Especially since this Peter Parker's doing his own thing. The end of No Way Home was essentially a hard reset in the franchise, so we could kind of do whatever we want. Which means this film will be defined by which villain Spider-Man is dealing with and why. Now I saw your note here. The portal opens up with Willem Dafoe from Lighthouse and Morbius, but good. I like your instincts, but I think we need to do something new. So I wanted to lay out what I believe makes a good Spider-Man villain so you can understand my choices. There are three things. First, originality. Spider-Man has an incredibly deep bench. Decades upon decades of zany, colorful, purple and green villains. So it is crucial that a Spider-Man movie attempts to tread new ground. Amazing Spider-Man knew to focus on Lizard. It made more sense than just trying to reinvent someone that already worked, like Dr. Octopus. The MCU trilogy took less iconic villains like Vulture and Mysterio and rewrote their power set and backstory to turn them into threats worthy of their own story. Really, the only time a villain has fallen completely flat for me was Dehane's Goblin. It just didn't offer any unique take on the character and he obviously could not measure up to the performance a decade earlier from Willem Dafoe, so you know, why bother? Our next Spider-Man movie should probably center around a villain or villains we have not seen in live action before. Second thing, connections. My other issue with the Hans Goblin, sorry to make you the focus, Dane, if you're watching this, but the good Spider-Man villains have a personal connection to Spider-Man. They're a friend or mentor or ghost from his past. And while the Hans should have worked this way, the movie did not nurture Harry and Peter's friendship. In fact, there were really only one or two scenes of both characters characters just hanging out outside of Spider-Man stuff. Well, you could probably say the same thing about Doc Ock. That relationship was so essential to the plot that the small screen time wasn't really an issue. The core conflict of this movie needs to involve the villains interacting with Peter outside of the suit. And third, that relationship needs to exacerbate the struggle between being Peter Parker and Spider-Man. Another villain who I think needed work, Electro, not only did not have a personal connection to Peter, he also just did not present Peter with any complicated choices. Stopping Electro Electro wasn't going to hurt his chances with a crush. Spider-Man, and most heroes to be honest, is all about choices. He needs to make a difficult choice, and the villain needs to present a personal conflict to Peter that will drive the internal stakes of the movie. So those are my three villain qualifications. Let's talk about Peter. Where is Peter now? We need to ask this question because, you know, where are we starting from? And where is the Marvel Cinematic Universe at this time? So this Peter is currently nobody. An 18 year old, I guess, living in a crappy New York City apartment somewhere in Midtown, probably considering the location of his big swing at the end of the movie. I was kind of curious about this, Kevin, and not to nitpick, not unlike I do on my podcast, mostly nitpicking. Sure, nobody remembers Peter Parker, but does he have like a social security number? I assume so, since he's taking classes to get his GED. I only ask because I want to know if there are any significant barriers we need to worry about. I'm going to assume he does and work from there. If I'm wrong, just let me know. His friends, MJ, Ned, and Flash are going to school at MIT, located in Cambridge, Mass, just outside of Boston. And I assume, because he went through all this trouble to write them out of the last movie, they're at least going to stay away for one movie. I don't want to undo that immediately. Peter is also broke, although like I said, he's living in a New York City apartment. The average cost of one of them is like three grand per month, but maybe because of all the spaceship 
ships and alien invasions the rent in New York City in the MCU is cheaper. Peter also does not seem to have any relationships with other superheroes. Spider-Man does, I guess, but Peter doesn't, so he can't just go to Doctor Strange for help, I guess. But he was in the Endgame fight, right? Or, or wasn't he? There isn't much evidence in Miss Marvel to suggest that he was, so maybe he wasn't? I don't know. So I'm gonna pitch a script that works either way. Another important question, what should we not do? Since, Mr. Feige, you have not told me which Avengers we can and cannot use, I'm not going to focus on any of them. I'm also not going to use any previously established main villains from other live action movies or any villains we expect to show up in future live action movies. So no Venom, no Carnage, no El Muerto, no Madam Web, no Craven, no Chameleon, no Morbius. I'm not sure about the Sydney Sweeney Black Cat rumors. I'd love it if you just told me, but hey, I get it. You have trust issues after the whole eight years later thing, but I'm not going to use Black Cat in this pitch either. I'm also not bringing back MJ, Ned, or Flash yet. Maybe in the future, but not yet. Also not touching Gwen Stacy, only because I think it'd be weird if Peter 3 told Peter 1 that he had a girlfriend named Gwen, and then the next thing Peter did was find a Gwen. Maybe it can happen in the future movies, or even at the end of this movie, but I don't want this movie to be about that. Last thing, I don't want to do anything that changes the status quo in any way that will rip out into future movies in a way that's significant, not destroying New York or anything that the other movies cannot just ignore. This is a self-contained pitch. And I think that's important. This is Peter's story, pure uncut Spider-Man. So let's get to the pitch. And yes, Kevin, I saw the note about the cap. Not a big hat guy, but for you, Kevin, I will wear one. It's this dorky 10th anniversary hat that I got from Disney. What do we think? Wow. Okay. So here's where we start. Peter finishes his GED. He's super smart, so it shouldn't be an issue. He goes to college. He gets a partial scholarship to Empire State University, but still needs to pay the bills. So he looks for some part-time jobs, pizza delivery, dog walking, temping, but the schedules make it different to keep the Spider-Man thing alive and none of them pay enough for Peter to pay rent on his New York City studio apartment and tuition at Empire State University. Then Peter notices an online story about Spider-Man with a god-awful picture. It makes him look bad and super blurry. And Peter gets the idea. Fake Spider-Man photos and sell them to a news organization. So it goes to everybody. The Times. The Post. And even though his pictures are good, they can't afford him and don't want to hire someone who literally no one knows. He needs a connection on the inside to make this work. Then Peter gets another idea. He actually does have a connection. Or did. Betty Brandt is currently working for the Bugle. So Peter hatches a plan to use the fact that he already kind of knows Betty to quickly befriend her and get his foot in the door. Peter goes to a park where he knows she hangs out with a dog he knows she will like, meets her, and talks to her. He mentions that he's an amateur photographer who specifically follows Spider-Man around and tries to get pictures. Betty has an incredible idea. You know, she happens to work at an outlet that loves running stories about Spider-Man. Maybe she can get Peter a meeting with her boss. That would be incredible. And Betty introduces Peter to her boss, Robbie Robertson. This is a fan favorite character and crucial member of Peter Parker's circle that has not made it into the Marvel Cinematic Universe yet. And this Robbie acts as a liaison between Peter and J. Jonah Jameson, who has decided to turn over a new leaf and become less of an Alex Jones and more of a legitimate organization. He is still very critical of Spider-Man, but at least this way Spider-Man isn't working for someone who thinks Super Soldier Serum makes the frogs gay. Peter also explains his rent problems to Robbie, and Robbie has an idea. Robbie's son Randy is new to the city and also looking for another roommate. Maybe Peter can move in with Randy. Peter is thrilled. Things are looking up. In the meantime, Peter is working hard at Empire State University, staying late, impressing professors, and he has a new lab partner in his organic chemistry class, a girl named Jenny. Jenny is also incredibly smart and driven. Where Peter is more interested in biology, Jenny is more interested in engineering, robotics, nanotech. She's really the only other person in the class that's on Peter's level. And Peter is sort of into her. He doesn't want to ruin things in class, but there's definitely chemistry. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, hey, When's this Spider-Man movie gonna have any Spider-Man? Well, that is the third story prong here. Peter is dealing with a new crime boss in the city. When Kingpin was shot and 
killed, a power vacuum opened up, and an opportunistic enforcer for Kingpin, a big albino dude with sawed down shark teeth who looks like a vampire, who everyone calls Tombstone. And Spider-Man is getting under Tombstone's skin. Spidey has stopped his drug dealing operation and beat up some of his enforcers, so Tombstone looks for outside help. He puts out a call for any assassin or superpowered freak who thinks they can take on Spider-Man, puts a $20 million bounty on his head, and the killers come out of the woodwork. So this is the A plot of the movie. Spider-Man vs. Tombstone. This is also where we can work in some of Spidey's lesser known but still fun villains, guys like Tarantula, Shocker, and Overdrive. So with this new muscle, Tombstone starts his proper takeover of New York. So let's talk about these new enforcers. They're all pretty simple jobbers to make the action scenes a bit more interesting. And they can all be introduced pretty quickly in a simple montage, much like this one from Speed Racer. I feel like since we already have Shocker, and he presumably has not been transported into the Morbiverse, it would be fun to bring him back as a jobber. Maybe even use more alien tech to upgrade its gauntlet so it shoots full sonic blasts or whatever it is that Comics Shocker does. Tarantula is a very simple character to introduce. Assassin with knives on his hands and feet who is acrobatic. You can also give him some poison or something like that so we can keep pace with Spider-Man. And then we've got Overdrive. And I know what you're thinking, Kevin. That sounds a lot like Big Wheel, the character everyone loves but we refuse to use for some reason. It does. And he's going to be an amalgamation of Overdrive and Big Wheel. You see, as you know, Overdrive has nanotechnology that lets him upgrade any vehicle he wants into a supercar. And one of the vehicles he finds can be the Big Wheel Mobile, which is like on display at an old World's Fair or something. Spider-Man can even call him Big Wheel, but for reasons that will be obvious later, this character is James Beverly, aka Overdrive. And to be honest, besides the car and the name, there's not much about Big Wheel to like. He's as one-off as one-off villains go. Every so often, he's mentioned again, but he's not someone like MODOK, who has a cool design and a cool name and also a rich comic history. So if a character with a little more going on like Overdrive drove the big wheel and even references the fact that it was created by someone named Jackson Wheel, I think that's enough. Or compromise open with Peter stopping the original big wheel who is driving the original big wheel and it's not great but later overdrive finds the big wheel and upgrades it into an absolute monster with tons of weapons and it'll be a fun second fight is that good I think that's good and we can even hint that big wheel is being backed by Mr. Negative who could be a great villain in the future for this spider-man or maybe miles or even silk if they ever show up in the MCU those nanobots have to come from somewhere right and I'm pretty sure in the comics he is one of Mr. Negative's henchmen. So those are the three villains. They all take a shot at Spider-Man individually. One night, Spidey is foiling a bank robbery that Tombstone set up as a trap and the villains make their move. They're not coordinated at this point, just sort of flailing at Spider-Man, but still effective enough to keep Spidey on the ropes. And that is where we get the introduction of our final principal character. Peter is saved by another costumed crime fighter who uses a flight suit equipped with various gadgets and calls herself the Beetle. That is Spider-Man's new ally here. And for anyone who isn't familiar, this is Jenny, Peter's friend from school. Traditionally, the Beetle is named Janice Lincoln, but A, Janice seems like an old lady name, and B, we already actually have a Janice Lincoln in Spider-Man Far From Home. She's one of Mysterio's teammates. That wasn't anything more than an Easter egg, so I think it's fine to have this character be named Jenny Lincoln, and like we all know that her real name is Janice, but she doesn't use it. But what is her deal? Why is she helping Spider-Man, and where has she been this whole time? Well, it will be revealed later on that Janice is Tombstone's daughter, and she knows her father is going to destroy the city, so she came up with the Beetle identity as a way to stop him. That information will not be available to Peter, for a while. In fact, for a good chunk of the movie, Peter will not know that Jenny is the Beetle, and she will not know that Peter is Spider-Man. But they'll still work together and have a fun Batman-Catwoman thing going on. This conflict will continue when Peter has the opportunity to put Tombstone away for good and Jenny stops Peter. She doesn't want her father to take control of the city, but at the same time, she isn't ready to see him put away. She really only did this to keep him down long enough for someone else to take the reins of New York City organized crime and then her father could slip back into the woodwork. Tombstone also would not know that Beetle is his daughter, although eventually he'd figure it out and use that to manipulate her into protecting him. And then the extra fun part, Peter's new friends Randy and Robbie are also traditionally related to Tombstone. In the comics, Tombstone and Robbie grew up together, so Robbie can be tied to the plot through their relationships. Our A plot and our B plot can coalesce when Peter learns what Tombstone's deal is. So why does it need to be this way? Why is Beetle, the friend turned enemy turned something in between the perfect villain for Peter to deal with right now. Well, I think coming off of No Way Home, Peter needs a villain who is all his own, someone who 
has never played a big role in these movies before. On top of that, I'd love to give Peter some new allies. Robbie, Ralph, and even Jenny can help Peter develop as a character. Jenny is burdened with great responsibility, but instead of being burdened towards helping all mankind, Jenny's responsibility is to protecting her family. Robbie is in a difficult position with an old friend, but ultimately does the right thing and helps defeat him. And Ralph is just a friend of Peter's. And Tombstone brings a lot to the table outside of just being Jenny's father. He's a crime boss, which this Peter has never dealt with, at least not on screen. And crime bosses are a huge part of Spider-Man's identity in the comics. Besides his connection to Kingpin, you've got guys like Hammerhead and Silvermane. It is always fun to watch Spider-Man bust up the mob. You know, going off of that, we've actually never seen Peter do a lot of things. He has never made a friend his age. He has never fought a villain his age. He's never had a job. He's never had a romance with a villain. There are so many new experiences for Peter. And Jenny works with all that. Also, Beetle can fly. And I would love to see this Peter Parker fight a flying villain. And I know what you're going to say. All of his villains fly. Sure. But he never fights Vulture in the air. Or Mysterio. Or Goblin. Sure. The train fight in Spider-Man 2 is amazing, but that fight from Spider-Man 3 is also so much fun. If it wasn't for the fact that this goblin was very dumb, watching Spider-Man swing through the city and attempt to keep up with a villain who can fly is an interesting challenge for Peter. And this Peter almost never swings through the city. I don't know why. The closest we get is this scene in Infinity War where he's trying to keep up with Ebony Maw. But besides that, none of Spidey's action scenes involve Spidey navigating New York City using skyscrapers. And since we've already used Vulture, Mysterio, Electro, and Green Goblin, there are very few flying villains left to utilize. Beetle is also a technology villain, and at this point in his life, Peter is out of fancy nanotech and instant kill modes and stuff like that, so it would be fun to force Peter to fight a villain with all of those advantages, especially since his mentor was Tony Stark, a mechanical engineer who created and wore a weaponized suit of armor. Beetle is Peter fighting an evil version of one of his father figures. Beetle is great. She can fly. She can be an anti-hero. She can flirt with Peter. She has an interesting connection to the real villain of the story, Tombstone. She would be an interesting friend or enemy in the future, and she has never been done before. And in the future, Beetle has a lot of spin-off potential. She could create the superior foes of Spider-Man, a spin-off of the Sinister Six featuring a couple of C-list Spider-Man villains who spend most of their time bickering and ripping off mob bosses. We've already got Beetle, Shocker, and Overdrive. Boomerang could even be introduced as a third roommate for Peter and Randy somewhere down the line, kind of like he is in the Nick Spencer Spider-Man comics, Beetle could also join the Thunderbolt. In the original Thunderbolt story, Baron Zemo recruited a team of supervillains and disguised them as superheroes. One of the team members was the original Beetle, Abner Jenkins, who took on the new ability of Mach 1. Jenny Lincoln could take his place on Zemo's team in a future Thunderbolts movie. More importantly, Beetle can help Peter better understand his new place in the world. Because of his connections to Tony Stark and Doctor Strange, sure, Peter was a vigilante, but he never needed to deal with the problems that usually come with that sort of work. He was never hunted by the police. He never had people in his life with strong opinions about Spider-Man who didn't know his secret. Beetle can help bridge that gap. She is also a vigilante with a very specific goal, stop her father, and she's working the wrong side of the law, but Peter needs to learn why that's sometimes worth it and why he will ultimately need to get comfortable being a true vigilante. And at the same time, Peter can teach Beetle about family. He's already dealt with a father who did crimes to support his family with Vulture and a pair of villain fathers in San man and goblin. Also, if Beetle is a little more like extreme, ready to kill, Peter can pull her back with the lessons he learned from the other Peters. In conclusion, Mr. Feige, this movie has everything. High flying action, romance, family, the shocker, and of course the potential for multiple spin-offs without being too in your face about it. Also, I saw your note about the title. The home thing is dumb. It was cute for one second, but after we did two, we realized we were in too deep. I completely agree, so I ditched that too. I think we should call this, well, we should have been calling these movies from the beginning, The Spectacular Spider-Man, and use the subheading Extermination. Because of the bugs. See, just, just not a hack guy. I don't, like, look at, look at this. Are you gonna hide this under a hat? As weird and cool as this hat is with all this all that stuff on it, it just, it's, it's not worth it. There we go. Into the box it goes, now it's on the floor. Okay. And now that I've got the hat off, I want to tell you about this video's sponsor, Displate. So, you may be wondering, what is a Displate? Well, a Displate is a one-of-a-kind metal poster that you can use to show off your passions in style. They are durable, light, and the colors really pop. They look awesome. 
There is a displate for everybody. They have tons of original art and some collections from things you already love like Star Wars, The Last Airbender, a bunch of video games, and of course, comics. I am a big fan of this series by Alex Ross, so I have the Trinity behind my couch. And then on the other side, not to be outdone, I love Ryan Minerding's work for Marvel, so I have this piece, which I believe is called The Road to Infinity War. It sits over my TV and it looks incredible. It's a super simple setup process. You just stick this protective leaf to the wall, then you stick the magnet on there, and in 20 seconds, you're done. It's easy to hang the disc plates and make adjustments since it's all on a magnet. You can even swap them out easily if you want to make changes. They make a great gift and they plant a tree for every disc plate sold, so that's nice. Take a look at their site. They have so many cool things that you haven't seen yet. And if you go to this link, you get a nice big discount. One to two disc plates are 25% off and then three and up is 29% off. The code is applied automatically. Give it a look. I'm sure you'll find something you like. Okay, I missed the hat. I'm putting it back on. And if this makes it onto YouTube sometime in the future, I guess I should thank all my patrons who continue to support the channel. Thank you everybody who listens to my podcast, mostly nitpicking. Thank you to everybody who watches these videos on Nebula. And thank you to everybody who follows me on Twitch, Instagram, TikTok, and mostly Twitter. I'm Nando V Movies on all those platforms. That's all I got. Stay safe. I'll see you next time.